Hey guys, how's it going? Welcome to Evening Devotion. So, before we start, my mother-in-law's home. She's feeling much better, and she says she's done with smoking. So, keep praying for her, guys, that the Lord will give her strength to overcome this. Because at least the last years of her life can be as high quality as possible, and she won't be suffering as much if she can get over this. So pray for the Lord to take this craving from her uh, and to give her strength and victory over this addiction. It's, it's going to be for her benefit. And, uh, and he can show himself to her in this. Uh, we know he'll do it because he's done it before. So let's, uh, let's lift her up and let's keep, keep her lifted up just like well, the rest of us who have addiction or have issues, you know, that the Lord will give us strength to overcome these things. But she's home now, and so we'll see where it goes from here. Tonight we're going to be reading out of Ezekiel 3.7. All the house of Israel are impudent and hard-hearted. Now this is the part in uh, the prophecies, and there's several. I did a, I did a, a pretty much all the prophets, I think. Um, and there's several prophets in a row where the Lord is very adamant. There was a several hundred years, quite a few hundred years, where the Lord was was adamant that they were going to hear what he had to say even if they wouldn't listen. And so he was using men within Israel, prophets of old, to speak to them, to speak very clearly to them. Uh, Ezekiel, Zechariah, Isaiah, uh, Jeremiah, on and on and on. And, and to be very, uh, very upfront with them. He's telling Ezekiel here in verse 7, but the house of Israel will not listen to you because they will not listen to me. If they won't listen to me, they're certainly not going to listen to you. For all the house of Israel are impudent and hard-hearted. So let's get some context to this. We're going to go up to the first verse. Moreover, he said to me, Son of man, eat what you find. Eat this scroll and go speak to the house of Israel. We, we feed on the word. That's what he did in this. He, he, telling him to feed on the word and then go speak these words. We do that with the Bible. Feed on this word, read this word, absorb this word, and go speak it to other people. Verse 2, so I opened my mouth, and he caused me to eat that scroll. And he said to me, Son of man, feed your belly and fill your stomach with this scroll that I gave you. So I ate it, and it was in my mouth like honey in sweetness. There's multiple times in the Old Testament where somebody was having a vision where they were made to eat a scroll. And it was a word that was given to them because this word was what the word they were going to speak. It was a prophecy. So he inspired him to write this book. He gave him this book. He gave him all these words. And they all said it tastes sweet as honey. But a couple of them said it, but it's bitter on their insides. That's that's the, the word. That's the Bible. It's sweet to taste. But when we get down to the truth, we get down to the nitty gritty of it, we get down to the conviction. It's bitter. Still good for us, though. If you've ever eaten too much honey, and they tell you, you know, every morning have a, like a tablespoon, maybe put some cinnamon on it or something, or mix a little bit in with something that you're having for breakfast. A tablespoon of honey every day is really good for you. Four or five or six tablespoons, not so much. <laughs> it tastes sweet, but it will make your stomach bitter. It will give you, it's a natural laxative. It will clean you out good. I know. I did it by accident one time. <laughs> Verse 4, then he said to me, Son of man, go to the house of Israel and speak with my words to them. This book, these, this scroll, that was God's words. For you are not sent to a people of unfamiliar speech and of hard language, but to the house of Israel. I'm not sending you to everybody outside of Israel. I'm sending you to your house, the house of Israel. Not to many people of unfamiliar speech and of hard language, whose words you cannot understand. Surely, had I sent them to you, they would have listened to you the house of Israel will not listen to you because they will not listen to me for all the house of Israel are impudent and hard-hearted behold I have made your face strong against their faces and your forehead strong against their foreheads like adamant stone harder than flint I have made your forehead do not be afraid of them nor be dismayed at their looks though they are a rebellious house so here's another example because I believe it was at least twice where this was this, this type of statement was made where he made the prophet's head 
he made him hard headed. He made him stiff necked so that he wouldn't bend, so that he wouldn't bow, so that he wouldn't turn, but instead would stand face to face with him and tell him, this is what the Lord said. Don't like it? Tough. The Lord does this. I, I have sometimes half think that he, because he took me through so much of what he took me through, especially my experience in the military, and it, it's basically turned me into a jerk, but I'm very upfront. And a lot of people will take that boldness and that, uh, that upfrontness as me being a jerk. But when I, and I, that's what I thought for a long time, the army made me an ass. But then I started looking at it more and I was like, well, wait a minute, but am I doing what everybody else is doing and purposely going to look for somebody to pick on? Or am I just responding to their, what they're doing? And I realized that the Lord did, did this. This is what it looks like. The Lord makes you hard headed. So when they speak, you don't just give in to them. Well, that's not what the Bible says, actually. It actually says this. No, you're wrong. You misinterpreted when they shake, shake their finger in your face. And you stand there, unmovable, and you say, no, you misinterpreted it because you don't like it. It says this. That's what it says. That's what it means. There is no interpretation. You either believe it or you don't. If you don't, you're now disagreeing with God and his word. Your business isn't with me. It's with him. Turn around. Go talk to him. You know, so you have that boldness where you're not intimidated by anybody else. That's a rough thing today. It, it's hard not to be because people are so adamant about getting in somebody's face. And if they sense any weakness at all, they will chew you up. And so you have to be bold. You have to stand your ground. This is what he's doing to these guys here. He's telling him, I, I've made your, your forehead like adamant stone, harder than flint. I've made your forehead. Do not be afraid of them, nor be dismayed at their looks, though they are a rebellious house. Don't worry about them. You stand your ground and tell them what I'm telling you to tell them. That's what we have to be today. Look at how people are. And when you stand up and you say, no, that's not how it's going to work. It's going to go the Lord's way. And here's what the Lord said it's going to go like. And when they disagree, I don't care. You can disagree all you want. I'm not the one you're upset with. It's, the, it's God. You turn them around and send them on their way. And today we have to do that. That's how you keep them at bay. By knowing the truth and standing on it. Verse 10, moreover, he said to me, son of man, receive into your heart all my words that I speak to you and hear with your ears. Moreover, he said to me, son of man, become familiar with my word. Receive it, absorb it, carry it. Hear it with your ears, hear it with your heart. And go get to the captives, to the children of your people and speak to them and tell them, thus says the Lord God, whether they hear or whether they refuse, whether they listen or not, tell them anyway. What have I told you guys? Same thing. Where do you think I got it from? They don't want to listen to you? Tell them anyway. They don't want to hear it? Tell them anyway. They turn on you, even if your own house turns on you. And they say, we're tired of hearing about this. You look them right straight in the eye and say, I don't care. You need to hear it anyway. And I'm going to keep speaking. If you don't like it, there's the door but I'm going to keep speaking. it. Get some earplugs if you don't want to hear it. It's that simple. I'm not going to hold back the truth because it offends somebody. I'm going to tell them the truth, even if it offends them. My hope is that it will offend people. I want people to be offended because the word of God, the gospel of Jesus Christ is offensive to people. Good. You need to be offended. And they're all going on about the stuff going on over here and all the Black Lives Matter stuff and the Palestine stuff and all this. They need to be offended. And when they say, oh, that offends me, good. I want you to be offended because this is going to cause you to stop and think. If you're, if you're not offended, if I cater to your feelings, you're never going to, never going to address it. You're just be like, oh, he gave in easy. You're going to go on with what you're doing. But if I offend you, it causes you to pause, it causes you to stop and think for a minute. Good. I'm glad you're offended. I want you to be. Because at that point, you've now, the door is open to crack for understanding. Because now you have to go th think about it. How can I respond to this? You are looking for something to use against me, but in the process, it's working for you. I've, I've sent, I don't know how many people these last five plus years back to the scriptures. Hey, here, why don't you go look at this? Better yet, why don't you go look at that? Hey, do you know this part in the Bible? And they've been forced to go to the Bible to find scripture 
to try to use to refute what I'm saying. And every single time that I do that and they go do that, it's bringing them into the Bible, causing them to be forced to read God's word and to receive the conviction in it so that they will turn and repent. And they never knew it was happening, that that's what I was doing to them. I was literally sending them back to the word. Go, go read this part. See for yourself what it says. Oh, better yet, the verse you gave me, why don't you read five up and five down? Look at the context. Here, I'll copy and paste it into my comments so you can read it. And they never realized that's what I was doing. I was forcing them to go read the Bible. Go read it. Then you'll see for yourself. And then they'll read that part where it, it turns away, turns them away and denies them. And they're like, hmm, how can I, what can I do with this? And they have to make a decision, either ignore it or do it. Go speak to them. Tell them whether they hear or whether they refuse. Then the Spirit lifted me up and I heard behind me a great thunderous voice. Blessed is the glory of the Lord from his place. Amazing. Go tell them. Are there no exceptions? No, not one. Even the favored race are thus described. The Jews, because they're the Jews, they don't give it, they don't, they're not given an out just because they're the Jews. It says in this very same book, only one third of them are going to be saved. That implies two thirds are not going to be. That's a lot of people. Only one third are going to be saved. Terrible. But that goes to show you how hard headed they are and, and how the Lord is going to deal with his people. You know, just because they're Jews doesn't mean they don't go to hell too. In fact, in the Old Testament, in the Exodus, the ground opened up and 5,000 of them fell. It says they fell alive into hell. The ground opened up and the people watched. These people fall down in this crack. Alive into hell. They went down. They were still alive while they were falling into it. Wow. And they were all Jews. They're still there. Been there for thousands of years. They got at least another thousand to go before they can stand before the Lord. Amazing. Even the favored race are thus described. Are the best so bad? Then what must the worst be? Interesting question. Come, my heart, consider how far thou hast a share in this universal accusation. And while considering, be ready to take shame unto thyself, wherein thou mayest have been guilty. And we all are, in one way or another, in one level or another. The first charge is impudence, or hardness of forehead, a want of holy shame, an unhallowed boldness in evil. They... They are bold in their evil deeds, thinking that God's not going to do anything about it. And I've even heard them say it. Well, God's not going to do nothing about this. Oh, really? I pray you repent before you find out how wrong you are. Before my conversion, I could sin and feel no compunction, no, no guilt, hear of my guilt and yet remain unhumbled and even confess my iniquity and manifest no inward humiliation on account of it. That's how people are. The, the first evidence of your salvation, of your conversion, is the fact that you feel guilty about the things you used to not feel guilty about. That you actually have faith and believe. That's the first evidence of salvation. The unbeliever does. It takes two people, both doing the same things. One of them gets convicted and repents. The other one doesn't. What's the difference? One of them actually feels guilty about what they did. The other one doesn't care. That's the difference between a believer and an unbeliever. Simple. The fact that we have guilt over that sin shows the Lord's working in us. Before my conversion, I could sin and feel no compunction. Hear of my guilt and yet remain unhumbled. And even confess, you know what they do? They smile and laugh. Confess my iniquity and manifest no inward humiliation on account of it. For a sinner to go to God's house and pretend to pray to him and praise him argues a brazen faceness of the worst kind. That would be a false professor. Look how many of those are in the church today. Alas, since the day of my new birth, I have doubted my Lord to his face. That's all of us. Murmured unblushingly in his presence, worshipped him before him in a slovenly manner, and sinned without bewailing myself concerning it. We've all done it. If my forehead were not as an adamant, harder than flint, I should have far more holy fear and a far deeper contrition of spirit. The Lord is close to those who are who have a contrite spirit. Remember what the Bible says? Woe is me. I am one of the impudent house of Israel. The second charge is hard-heartedness, and I must not venture to plead innocent here. 
Once I had nothing but a heart of stone, and although through grace I now have a new and fleshy heart, much of my former obduracy remains. I'm still not fully out of sin yet. I am not affected by the death of Jesus as I ought to be. That's a key one. We talked about this, remember? <clears throat> Being affected by the gospel, by the description of his suffering on the cross. You know how many people it has no effect on at all? In fact, surprisingly, over 60% of American Christians, over 60, almost 70. You can look, look these surveys up. Over 60% of American Christians don't even believe Jesus died on the cross. They don't want the conviction because if they suddenly come to the place where they believe he did, that means they have to address their sin. I'm not affected by the death of Jesus as I ought to be. You guys have heard me in tears as I'm describing it in multiple videos. I'm affected by it. It means a lot to me. Neither am I moved by the ruin of my fellow men, the wickedness of the times, the chastising of my Heavenly Father, or my own failures as I should be. That's holy conviction, righteous conviction. We need that. We should be convicted about those things because we still have sin. Every single human being on this planet, saved or not, still has sin. The one difference between us and the rest of the world is that we have forgiveness for it. Oh, that my heart would melt at the recital of my Savior's sufferings and death. You preach the gospel to a group of a hundred people, and you see one or two people start to shed tears or look down, they're the ones being changed by it. The rest of them stand and look on and could care less. They're not. Would to God I were rid of this nether millstone within me, this hateful body of death. This is what Paul prayed. Blessed be the name of the Lord. The disease is not incurable. The Savior's precious blood is the universal solvent. And me, even me, it will effectually soften till my heart melts as wax before the fire. Are we born again? Are we converted? Are we changed? Does this mean something to us? This is the passion. This is the fire in the spirit. Does it mean something to us that he died for us to pay our debt for sin on the cross, that his blood was shed on our account, and he was buried and rose again for our justification, our sanctification, and our glorification. Does this mean something to us? Does the price paid have an effect on us? Does it have value with us? There are a lot of people in the world today throughout that have lived over the generations and, and today who do a lot for others. They may do work for them. They may help them with this. They may do that, this kind of stuff. And the people that it's being done for are in a place where there's no value attached to that. Even if they don't pay them, there's no value attached to the work being done for them or what somebody has done for them. Anytime anybody does something for you, there's great value attached to that. The problem today is most people don't see any value in it. They don't, they don't attach any kind of monetary value or any kind of spiritual value or emotional value to anything anybody does. That's the problem with the world and the sacrifice of Christ on the cross. They don't put no value to it. Except for the born-again believer, it has all value to us. It is the most precious thing. All of human history hinges on that one moment 2,000 years ago. Because everything before it points to it and everything here now at this advanced time points back to it. If we are born again, our heart has changed. And over time, over growth, over sanctification, when the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts, when the Spirit wells up in us, these things start to have an effect on us. They start to affect us. And instead of hiding from it or running from it, like what we see a lot of people doing today, that's why there's a great apostasy. They're running from the conviction. They know the truth. They know the truth. They're running from the conviction. Those that aren't, those that are receiving it, those that are accepting it, those that are realizing this was done for me, how dare I look away? How dare I run from it? You know, the Bible, as it records the, the gospel and its multiple re re recordings and, and other people that have talked about it after the fact in their epistles, you know, nobody ever says anybody hid their eyes. Have you ever notice that? Nobody ever records that somebody hid their face or hid their eyes from it that I can remember. 
They all gazed upon him. And maybe at that time, maybe they didn't realize why they couldn't take their eyes off him. All of the angels were there. All the demons were there. Everybody, all creation was paying attention. Even people thousands of miles away in other countries were making record of it. The, the Chinese, that we found, have some old record from back then. They said, they, they talked about the sun being here. The son of God. They record, uh, even down to the date on when the eclipse happened, when the earthquake happened. And they relate it all to the Son of God. Amazing. So the whole world knew what was happening. And look at here 2,000 late, years later, look what everybody's doing. We're, we're almost 2,000 years away. 2032, technically, would be the 2,000-year mark. Almost 2,000 years away, look what people are doing. They're looking away any way they can. They're avoiding it at all costs. They are even going so far as to shoot people who are preaching it in the streets and attack people who are sitting in churches for no other reason than they are preaching the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. They are so adamant that they are, the, the, the conviction is so painful to them that they want to avoid it at all costs. And here, and here we now, people, you see all kinds of people now stepping up saying the great apostasy is here. Yeah, it's been here for a while, actually. It's ramping up, though. It's here. We see it. I started seeing it in 20, late 2019. It was really evident. Now it's really, really evident. And all the more as we get closer to that time, of course, it's a marker of that time. When we ever had this in, 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 uh, in the world? This kind of apostasy, defection of from, from faith and truth. Look at it. It's all around us. Never had it before. Never had it before. I grew up in the 70s. Never had it before. Never had anything like this before. Of course we're close. So what we're seeing is we're seeing a, a great division in the people. Like one guy I heard say a couple days ago, he says, there are no fence riders anymore. People have picked a side. They've either chosen the side of Christ or they've chosen the side of the world. I tend to agree. There are people picking sides now, and most of them seem to be going the wrong direction. But there are the rest of us who are called, the rest of us who are saved, the rest of us who are of the bride are all choosing the side of God. And we're being gathered together. We're being separated from everybody else. You guys, some of y'all mentioned in the comments of, a, of the recent video where I talked about that. Comment below if you feel that separation and you commented, yeah, I feel it. Yeah. It's a weird sensation. I can literally feel like I'm being separated from everything. Not indifferent, but just like I'm not being affected by that stuff. It's affecting other people around me, but it's just not bothering me. I don't know. It's weird. It's weird. But the Bible talks about that stuff. The wheat and the tares will be separated from each other. The tares gathered up, thrown in the fire. The wheat gathered up, thrown in the barn. So that time is, is coming quickly. We're right on the verge of it. it. It couldn't be more obvious. But you know, because people are so adamant to avoid it, if the Lord himself sat down in Times Square and opened up a Bible and read from it and all the world could see it, they still would deny it. They'd watch, they'd listen, and as soon as he stopped talking and left, they would deny it. They don't want it. Bible prophecy must be fulfilled. If God himself shook everything and brought everything to a screeching halt, stopped the sun in the middle of the day at noon, which in the Bible and the turbulation is going to happen, stopped it and spoke and said, the whole world spoke and said, this is how things, this is how it is. As soon as he quit and everything went back to normal, everybody would forget because it's supposed to happen. There's a reason why we see and we're awake and the rest of the world isn't. There's a reason why we accept it and the rest of the world doesn't accept it. There's a reason why we're treated badly, but the world loves its own. And those are all things that the Lord said would happen when the end was here. Here we are. <clears throat> People are hard-headed and hard-hearted. And that's a marker of the times. He said it would be like the days of Noah. What was going on in the days of Noah? Oh, they were marrying, giving in marriage. Everything was business as usual. And what else were they doing? Denying everything. Moses preached for 120 years and not a single person believed him. 
And even when the time come when the Lord said, all right, Noah, get him in the ark. All y'all get in the ark and I'm going to shut the door. They went up in there. They stayed back. God shut that big giant door and they stuffed a bunch of jute in there around it to seal it up so water couldn't get in. If you don't know what jute is, you can look it up. J-U-T-E or J-U-T-E. Sealed the door. And then they all went up on top deck. And then the rain started coming. And it poured rain. And when people started to realize, hey, wait a minute, this water's like knee deep. We need to go talk to Noah. It was only then that they started to realize the truth. After the destruction started. Same thing's going to happen in the tribulation. After the tribulation starts, then they're going to know. And so what happened? They're banging on the side of it. Noah let us in. He's looking down. I didn't close the door. I didn't close it. God closed it. It wasn't me. I can't open it. If he closed it, no man can open it. What it remember what it says? If God shuts a door, no man's opening it. If God opens a door, no man's shutting it. I didn't close it. There's nothing I can do. You should have got on the boat before you before we loaded everybody up and closed it. Too late. The door is shut. I never knew you. Well, luckily, even after we're taken. Even after the tribulation starts, the Lord is still going to show extreme mercy on the rest of the world. He is going to allow room for repentance and allow people to become saved, but it's going to be vastly different than it is now. Now it's a free entrance. It's a free day at SeaWorld. The gates are open. Come on in, y'all. You don't even have to check at the gate. Just go. Got your passes. Let, let's go. Pretty soon SeaWorld's shutting down. Pretty soon the Amusement park shutting off the lights. And everyone that's stuck is stuck. There's no changing. There's no, you can pay for parking and you're still not going to get in if the doors are closed. The, the, after, when it's time, they that's it. Go to, go to SeaWorld when they're having the big free day. Look at all the people flowing through and they cut it off at a certain time. And you can see the difference because all the gates shut. And people are standing up there piling up in line. Hey, I thought it was free day. The time's over. And they all got to pay for tickets or show their season passes. Yeah. It's weird. Happened to us one time. The gate closed right behind us. We were the last ones on that line to get in. Everybody else was, hey, the time's expired. Because they had like a three-hour window in order to get in. And, and we just barely made it. Don't be surprised that people are hard-headed and hard-hearted. Don't be surprised if people won't listen. The Lord told us that was going to happen. It's been a, a reoccurring thing throughout history with Israel. And here we have a, an account of the Lord telling them, they're not going to listen to you because they won't listen to me. You go tell them anyway. You let them hear it. And the reason why is so that no one has an excuse. And no one will have an excuse. Let us, let us believe on what the Lord has told us and let us take it, read it, accept it. And like the devotion says, let's not exclude ourselves from the, the shortcomings, but instead admit it. Humility. Lord, I have issues. I struggle with everything. I am exactly what this is. Because I don't dedicate every, every bit of my time to you. Because I don't dedicate everything to you. Now, in our case, he understands we have justification for that. Look at the world we live in. But praise God, there's a day coming when none of that will be an issue anymore. There will be no more stumbling blocks or roadblocks in our way. We will stand in his presence and glorify him to his face. Adding our voices to the chorus of the General Assembly of Heaven. I don't know about you guys, but I look forward to that day. When this pain and suffering is over with and we get to see things as they should have been because we're going to get to see him fix it all and we'll get to see the jews for for first time in thousands of years actually listen to god and they'll become the people they were meant to be we're going to be there for that amazing i love you all very much i bless you all in jesus name i'll see you in the next video